China, the Middle Kingdom, is a civilization which stretches back for more than 3,500 years. Traditionally regarded as a land of mystery, it is only in this century that ancient China's secrets have started to unravel with incredible archaeological discoveries, providing us with an insight into China's early civilizations. You could be forgiven for thinking that this is Shanghai or Beijing. It is, in fact, London's Chinatown. Many capital cities in the West now have their own Chinese quarter, where Chinese culture is easily accessible. Whilst visitors can experience the flavors and architecture of the East, ancient China still reaches across hundreds of years and thousands of miles with traditional symbols of lions and dragons abounding. The reality of ancient China is, however, a far cry from this bright, glossy Western interpretation. Chinese legend says that in the beginning of the world, there was a great chaos, and the sky and the earth were like the yolk and white of an egg. Then Pan Ku, primal man, was born. He gave form to the earth and sky, creating earth from dark, impure elements and sky from bright, clear elements. Every day, the sky became 10 feet higher, the earth 10 feet thicker, and Pan Ku became 10 feet taller. Pan Ku lived for 18,000 years, by which time he was very tall, the sky was very high, and the earth was thick and solid. When Pan Ku shed tears, they formed the Yellow and Yangtze rivers. His breath formed the wind, his words created roaring thunder, and his darting looks became lightning. When he finally died, his eyes became the sun and moon, and his body formed the five sacred mountains of China. His hair turned into the trees and plants, and his fleas became the human race. In the countryside of China, nothing much has altered over the last few thousand years. Fishermen have fished on the Yangtze River in much the same way for centuries, whilst men and women work the fields. There is, however, a noticeable lack of ancient architecture in this rural landscape, as most buildings were made from perishable wood. We can, however, through archaeological finds, chart human civilization in China right back to Paleolithic and Neolithic times. This is followed by the Shang Dynasty of 1600 to 1027 BC. These people were the successors of the Stone Bronze Age people of China, and the Shang Dynasty is the first indisputable dynasty in Chinese history, whose 27 or 28 kings ruled through divination the reading of oracle bones and shells to forecast events. The earliest Chinese writing also comes from this period. This was a feudal system, 
where those at the core of the state were linked to the royal house by blood, beliefs, and self-interest. The Western Zhou dynasty runs from 1027 BC to 771 BC. The Zhou were a semi-nomadic clan who originated from the northwestern edge of Chinese land. And as they moved south, they came into contact with what was then China and the Shang kings. Over two generations, the Shang were gradually replaced. Uh, about 1000 BC, uh, China, what was then China, which was just a, a relatively small area in the north, uh, was conquered by the Zhou, what became the Zhou dynasty and the Zhou kings. And they set up or continued a feudal system of government which quickly began to break down until the feudal lords began to take control and set themselves up more or less as, as princes of, of separate states. They still had allegiance, allegedly, to this king of Zhou, but in fact they were virtually independent. Confucius was an arch-feudalist, and he, of course, came from the ruling class, uh, so naturally wanted to perpetuate it. Um, and his teachings, which became king, as it were, for, for right until this century, uh, Confucius' teachings came out of that. But he wasn't alone. There were other schools of philosophy which advocated other ways of running China, one of which was not feudal. And in around 256, BC, along came a man who we know as the first emperor of China. He was head of a small state, the, the state of Qin. And he was very much influenced by a quite different philosophy, the uh, legalist philosophy, which said, you know, government should be by merit, uh, the people were rotten, and therefore needed to be governed by a series of very harsh measures. Uh, he called it rewards and punishments, but there weren't many rewards. He was hot on the punishments. Um, and he actually became extremely successful in organizing his society. It was a terrifying society, but uh, it worked. And ultimately, it worked in that he was able to model his army on the same principles. His army became more efficient. and. The long and the short of it was that in 221 BC, he's able to conquer all the other states of China and set himself up as top guy and called himself the first emperor of China. Each of these states had been begun developing their own scripts for Chinese. He didn't want that. He couldn't communicate properly if he had different scripts. So he set to work, or set people to work, to devise a standardized script uh, for China, uh, which would operate right through his empire. And that standardized script is still with us. So when the uh, first emperor of China uh, codified the language, and uh, he forbidden anyone else to use any other uh, scripts. And today, through archaeology, we discovered uh, all kinds of evidence uh, showing that uh, writing or writings uh, before the codification by the first emperor of China uh, was uh, a great, uh, in a great diversity. And you can see all kinds of uh, like a bird script and uh, a script kind of written like a little bird or a little uh, snake. And uh, you can see some uh, new elements being added uh, to the writing, which probably represent some kind of uh, local dialect. And all these things uh, disappeared after the codification. And you can see Chinese writing kind of being brought into the mainstream. And uh, uh, or we see the, the, the official writing become uh, uh, something uh, sacred. Nobody can change it. It's a little difficult for people used to English and European languages to conceive, but uh, Chinese script is not dependent upon uh, the sounds of words. It's rather like our number system. The number eight can be pronounced eight if you speak English, wheat if you're French, acht if you're German, whatever. But the symbol is the same for all of you. Uh, and that's what Chinese characters are like. All Chinese characters are, are as it were, numbers. They are symbols for ideas. They're not connected to the sound of the word when you say it. And so, although through his empire people spoke different languages, 
they all wrote the same. And so he, could, he had unity, and he had a means of communica communicating right across his empire. The first emperor, whose full title was Xing Shi Wan Ti, made himself emperor in 221 BC. Before taking over the other states of China, he was King Shen of Xin in the northwest of China. He ascended the throne in 246 BC at the tender age of 13, but things had gone far from smoothly at first. The man who actually had control of Xing was Sheng's regent, a minister called Lu Pu Wei. In 238 BC, Sheng's own mother was suspected of being involved in a plot against the young king. Sheng crushed the rebels, banished Lu Pu Wei, and was forced to place his own mother under house arrest. Unable to trust his own mother, King Sheng became mistrustful of anyone. It is perhaps these events that led to his strict rules. Chang is described by one of his officials as a man with a high-bridged nose, long, narrow eyes, the breast of a bird of prey, and the voice of a jackal, of an ungrateful disposition, and the mind of a tiger or wolf. Usually he behaved decently to his men, but in the intoxication of success, he only made them his victims. This paints a fairly ruthless picture of the man who became first emperor. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. He steadily prepared the Qing state for a great destiny to reunite all of China's lands under one emperor, himself. All Xing men had to dedicate their lives to military service and systems of rank amongst nobles were removed. Power came from only one source, the king. He abolished the feudal system totally. That is to say, he abolished hereditary class uh, and uh, China became a society where you were promoted according to merit uh, and according to ability. In order to run this state efficiently, he set about strong centralization measures, and that meant good communications for a start. So he devised a road system, and the roads radiated out from his capital at Xianyang, and his roads went straight, rather like Roman roads, out in star fashion to the furthest uh, boundaries of his empire. He set about the defense of this new state that, he, that he'd produced. And one of the most important ways of doing that was to defend it against attack from outside. All China's enemies, once you've got a, some, a concept that you can call China, all Chinese em enemies came from the north. And he built the Great Wall of China to keep those enemies out. The Great Wall is still one of the seven wonders of the world and remains an astounding achievement in terms of its size, stretching over 3,000 miles long from East China to the Gobi Desert, and rising up to a height of 25 feet. Watchtowers were built on rocky heights, and garrisons were erected by riverbanks to accommodate men to staff the wall. Now, bits of that wall had been there before. They'd been built by these various states as they were fighting each other to keep the other states out. But he joined the whole lot up about 1,400 miles uh, from the sea in the east right across into the desert in, in, into the west and built this Great Wall of China. Uh, that uh, helped to keep China safe from attack from the north and meant he could then think about pacifying what was inside. A famous Chinese folk tale, which is over 1,000 years old, tells of a Lady Mengqiang who, on hearing that her husband had died working on the wall, traveled 10,000 miles to find his bones for a proper burial. When she arrived at the wall, she spent days searching for his body, but to no avail. So she lay down by the wall and wept for days. The wall was so moved by her grief that part of it collapsed, revealing her husband's remains. We tend to see the first emperor, that is, we in the West, looking in from outside, tend to see him uh, as a very important uh, dramatically clever, uh, able ruler. Uh, the building of that great wall, as far as the Chinese people are concerned, even the 20, in the 20th century, uh, was a horrific event. 
we look upon it as a, as a major triumph of, of mankind. It's the only man-made thing you can see from the moon. It's built across quite inhospitable terrain. Uh, the uh, cost of building it in terms of money was great, but in terms of human life was awful. Many, many died. And the Chinese have inherited from this a kind of belief that people buried under walls makes them strong. Now, whether that belief existed before the time of the first emperor is not known. It certainly exists now. Even in the 20th century, rumors still come up of people being surreptitiously buried un under constructions in order to make the, uh, that construction strong. In the 1921, in Hong Kong, when they conducted a census, they found they had no returns on male children under the age of three. And it was because, at the same time, a rumor was going around Hong Kong that they were going to build a bridge across the harbor, resting on 99 piers, and under each pier was going to be buried a boy baby. And so no one declared boy children at all, and the census was totally messed up by this. Um, and it's the kind of belief which is likely to emerge all the time in, in Chinese society, and one meets it again and again. Uh, and it's said to start from the Great Wall. Whatever, many people died building that Great Wall, and it remains for the Chinese a symbol of cruelty and oppression and of this tyrannical ruler. He standardized everything. All the weights and measures were standardized before each state had had its own, and even bits of states had had their own. He said, no, there will be one standard measure for everything, including, and this is the example that's very often quoted, including the length of axles of carts. Um, and uh, that actually wasn't so silly. He had these, this wonderful road system, but it wasn't a paved road system. It was a mud road system. And in wet weather, the wheels of the carts would very quickly make ruts. And unless you all have the same length axle, you know, one end of the cart is going to be tilted too much, and if you're unlucky, you're going to have a road accident, and you're going to block your communication system. So he more or less invented the tramway by having these uh, sa same length axles. He invented uh, standardization of coinage, whereas everyone else had had their own coinage before that. Um, he tried to make everything absolutely conform according to what he wanted. The first emperor of China achieved the notion of a unified China, of an empire. Uh, it was able to encompass Chinese people who, because they lived over a very wide physical area, um, developed local customs, local manners of speech, um, even slightly different local political systems, but there were uh, that is at the, at the local level, but uh, the notion that China was a whole, was a unity, and that there should be a unified central government was with China forever from then on. Despite his success in unifying China, the first emperor's weakness was his fear of death. There were at least three assassination attempts on his life, besides which he had set himself up as the most important man in Chinese history, and only immortality would be a suitable follow-up to his reign on earth. So his preparations for death were as lavish as his palaces and great wall. He died in 210 BC whilst on a tour of the eastern provinces, traveling along the Yangtze River and the coast of the Yellow Sea. He had had a dream about fighting a sea god and was advised that if he wished to become an immortal, he must kill a giant fish with a crossbow. At Chifu, he killed what was most likely a whale, but the bitter irony was that he died a month later. His grand counselor, Li Su, and another advisor, afraid of losing their own lives, covered up his death, having his coffin carried around in a covered litter. This gave the men time to forge the emperor's will, leaving his empire to his second son. News of the emperor's death was released after their return to the capital, Xianyang. He was eventually buried at Mount Li, the place where he had constructed an incredible tomb. The first emperor of China, we know him through uh, books uh, in the Shi Ji, the records of great grand historian, and uh, it's written in great detail, its uh, family and its achievement, but also described its burial and the grand scale of his tomb construction is described in the book. Su Ma Xian was an historian who lived about a hundred years on from the first emperor and recorded the Shi Shi, or historical records, which discussed how the tomb was built. As soon as the first emperor became king of Xin, work was begun on his mausoleum at Mount Li. 
More than 700,000 conscripts from all parts of China labored there. They dug three underground streams, they poured molten copper for the outer coffin, and they filled the burial chamber with models of palaces, towers, and official buildings, as well as fine utensils, precious stones, and rarities. The waterways of the empire, the Yellow and Yangtze rivers, were represented by mercury and were made to flow mechanically. Above, the heavenly constellations were depicted, while below lay a representation of the earth. Lamps using whale oil were installed to burn for a long time. The actual tomb, buried deep under a grassy mound, is in the process of being investigated and preserved, so the magnificence of its interior can only be imagined for the time being. Today, the mound is surrounded by fields, but in 210 BC, there would have been a walled inner enclosure with gates on each side, with another walled enclosure around that. These enclosures would have been part of the strict measures taken to protect the tomb from grave robbers. And it is written that inside the tomb, there were also automatic crossbows set to fire upon any intruders. The excavated pits of the first emperor's famous terracotta army are one and a half kilometers to the east of the burial mound. In archaeology, uh, you can see this tomb is still there today. And most amazingly, uh, it's the probably very famous terracotta soldiers, or also called uh, terracotta army of the first emperor of China. It was discovered uh, during the Cultural Revolution uh, uh, now it's a museum and uh, with the three huge uh, pits full of uh, uh, terracotta figurines in uh, uh, re uh, immense size or even taller. Some of them runs like over 200 uh, centimeters. And so some people say they were kind of early northerners, much stronger than today's uh, Chinese. Estimated around 7,000 uh, terracotta soldiers were buried uh, beside the emperor's tomb. Uh, not just soldiers, also uh, horses and chariots. And uh, they, these soldiers were originally uh, had uh, bronze weapons, but these bronze weapons uh, mostly uh, were taken by uh, a peasants' rebels rebellion or rebels when they first got in the tomb the first thing they wanted was uh, weapons bronze weapons so the tomb was disturbed and not long after it's been constructed however I mean it's still in in packed I mean today if you go to the site you actually you can see these soldiers and these uh, clay horses and why did the first emperor uh, bury these soldiers' horses. Uh, they were replicas in uh, or by his tomb. It's always a question, fascinating question. To consider this uh, phenomenon or question, we may also have to go back to uh, an earlier period, uh, such as the Shang Dynasty. In Shao inscriptions, it's been recorded that uh, human sacrifice. Uh, was frequently used. The numbers can run uh, five, six, uh, dozen, or hundred, and sometimes thousands. I don't know exactly uh, whether they actually used a thousand men to uh, chop the head off and bury it uh, in or beside king's tombs. It's, uh, it's not uh, so far no uh, evidence of uh, over a thousand people being cured, but certainly uh, several hundreds kind of uh, beheaded men were buried at the site that have been discovered. This human sacrifice uh, is very much of Shang, Shang Dynasty uh, custom. And when the Zhou ruler came, uh, they reduced the use of human sacrifice. And because we, we all remember uh, Confucius uh, was very much against uh, the barbarian custom of uh, human sacrifice. But rulers or rich people, they are not quite giving up the idea. But since they, unless very powerful rulers still 
do, sacrifice human beings, most people start to use replicas made in clay or wood, and that's you can see through Chinese, uh, early Chinese uh, tombs. Uh, so when the first uh, emperor of China, when he started to build his tomb when he was still alive, and he also started to make a terracotta army to guard his tomb, uh, why uh, did he do so? I mean, who were his enemies? And that's uh, still uh, be debated among scholars, but generally believe that uh, in the east side of China, and uh, he was not completely in control, so still rebels and uh, rebellions against the, the, the first emperor of China uh, at that moment. So maybe it was his worry uh, made him to uh, make this uh, huge uh, terracotta army to defend himself uh, in the underworld. Little Chinese art can be definitely dated to the Qin dynasty. It's the subsequent Han dynasty which has proved rich in archaeological and artistic finds. This dynasty was founded only four years after the death of the first emperor, following a period of civil war. The Western Han Dynasty began in 206 BC to AD 8, and then sandwiched in between is the short Xin Dynasty of AD 9 to 23. This is followed by the Eastern Han Dynasty of AD 24 to 220, so we are now looking at a total time span of around 400 years. The Han Dynasty is one of the great periods of Chinese art, um, one of the great periods of Chinese history. More or less, the cycle of dynasties, which continued uninterrupted until the beginning of the 20th century, had its pattern set in the Han Dynasty in this period from 200 BC to 200 AD, roughly speaking. And Thousands upon thousands of Han Dynasty tombs have been discovered from that time. Those are the material that give us the greatest insights, not only into Han beliefs about death and the afterlife, but also the daily life and activities and what they considered important uh, in their lives. One of the most spectacular finds has been a series of tombs in Changsha, in Hunan province, right in central China. Essentially, there are mounds about 16 to 20 meters high. In one of these, three tombs were discovered, uh, side by side, slightly overlapping. Uh, each consisted in a deep uh, pit cut through the man-made mound, back down to ground level and slightly below. In this was a magnificent uh, heavy timber structure forming a compartment, central compartment for uh, the tomb, for the actual coffins, which were a nesting set of coffins, and four compartments at the top and bottom and on the two sides, which contained grave goods. Uh, all of these were elaborately <coughs> wrapped up um, for instance, baskets of clothing, tagged and listed in an inventory on bamboo slips. The whole um, <coughs> burial was sealed in with a thick layer of charcoal and another thick layer of white clay, which rendered the whole thing impermeable. Uh, this was a common method of burial in this particular area, and uh, Ever since, well, the beginning of this century, tombs in this area have been discovered that were in good condition. But uh, the difference in this tomb is that uh, the condition in which everything was found was practically pristine. There had been little decomposition, even of the body of the lady who was buried there. In the nest of three, three coffins, uh, the, practically the last object that was deposited in uh, the tomb would have been a silk banner which was folded and laid on top of the innermost coffin, that containing the body of the lady herself. It appears to be a funerary banner which 
might have been carried in procession uh, to the grave and which represents the, uh, the lady herself seen with her servants in the center and her transformation into a heavenly spirit uh, with a snaky body right at the top of the painting. Dunhuang is an extraordinary site which links the Han dynasty to the present day because originally it was in 111 BC that uh, the warlike emperor, Emperor Wu Di, seeking to consolidate his power, uh, expanded westwards and eastwards. So in 111 BC, Dunhuang um, which means great and uh, glorious, something like that, um, was established as a garrison commandery. But it really became, began to become famous much later, in the 4th century AD, when a Buddhist monk, uh, his name is Yuezun, uh, was said to have carved a, um, uh, a cave probably for solitary meditation, in an amazing kilometer and a half long cliff, about 25 kilometers from Dunhuang to the southeast. And following on, during the period of the northern dynasties, that's in the 5th and 6th centuries AD, and then at an increasing tempo in the following centuries, Caves were cut at Dunhuang, one after another, after, out of the gravel cliff. Because the stone was a sort of pebbly gravel, um, <coughs> stuck together and quite easy to excavate, but not easy to carve, uh, these uh, caves were all lined inside with a kind of clay plaster mixed with organic material, wild hemp uh, and straw which you can see very thickly enfolded in the plaster. This plaster has lasted over a thousand, thousand five hundred years without showing any signs of cracking or deterioration. And uh, going inside these caves is quite an extraordinary experience um, because every surface and sometimes even the floor is decorated, the floor with tiles, but uh, the rest clay plaster on the walls and uh, stucco figures which were built on an armature, wooden armature. And these, while they were at first perhaps intended simply for solitary meditation in the wilderness, according a, a vital part of Buddhist practice, soon became shrines to, to the Buddha. There are paradise scenes, um, there are scenes of uh, daily life, of merchants being held up on the Silk Road by border guards or by bandits. Dunhuang was this important place supported by the Han uh, expansionary uh, <coughs> empire. Um, it was that expansion of Han which made it possible for the overland route to Western Asia to become a real highway of cross-cultural influences and communication. And uh, many luxuries reached China and left to China through this, uh, this route. The Buddhist art in the caves of Dunhuang reflects how popular the religion became in the 6th and 7th centuries in China. But it did not displace any of the existing religions already in practice, shaping and evolving around these instead, creating an ethos of balance and harmony. It's very difficult to talk of one religion for China. There really isn't a Chinese religion. What China has practiced is a whole 
heap of religious elements which have come together to make a kind of religious stew, I suppose. Um, most people in China, most ordinary people in China, uh, have practiced a whole mix of religions all at once. And they would include Buddhism, which came from India into China about the first century AD, sometime not too far from the time of Christ, and very rapidly gained uh, acceptance in China, but became changed in the process. In Chinese Buddhism isn't much like Indian Buddhism. In fact, it's become very much Chinese style. Uh, but Buddhism was very acceptable to people. They hadn't at that time got a religion which talked about personal salvation in any kind of sense. Uh, you were merely a cipher in a family before that, and then there was fate which, which kind of sat over you. But there wasn't any way in which you could work in this life to get a better life afterwards. And Buddhism must have been you know, like real jam on your bread when it first came into China, uh, because suddenly the Chinese people could see that there was... You know, there was value to the suffering that they, that they certainly experienced, that they could get something out of that. Uh, Taoism, that's T-A-O, Tao, usually spelled, but uh, Taoism was uh, a native Chinese philosophy, which was one of those philosophies which was current at the time of Confucius uh, and the legalists. And Taoism um, is very dear to Chinese hearts. It's a, a kind of naturalist philosophy, basically saying that nature doesn't really take any actions at all, nature just is. And man, if he really wants to be happy, and um, must somehow conform with nature, and that means he mustn't do anything either. It's a kind of hippie philosophy in some ways. Um, you know, you didn't have to ask where your money was coming from, somehow it would appear. Um, but it certainly appealed to the Chinese very much, and this notion that you could be one with nature and that the best you could hope for is to become one with nature was what Taoism came from. Trying to get like nature um, led them down some very odd paths because nature, people could see, went on forever. It was eternal. And therefore, the notion that man should be eternal started to occur to people. And they started looking for the elixir of life. They started looking for ways to make themselves un immortal. Uh, and they took some very strange paths to that, including looking for the Philosopher's Stone and all, all, all these things. Um, but it became very obvious that whatever they did, whatever techniques they cooked up, uh, whatever medicines they, they, they tried to invent for themselves, or whatever fasting techniques or whatever they, they went in for, that they died. Um, and round about the time that Buddhism came to China, uh, that is not too long after the time of Christ, um, Taoism had, of its own accord, merged into an area where it began to separate body and soul and became a religion. Because the body can't go on forever, that was obvious, you died. But perhaps there's a soul which can. So Taoism became a religion too. They also believed in ancestor worship. And ancestor worship, uh, in the Chinese form of it, uh, consists of worshipping your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather and so on in the male line backwards as gods, uh, and those ancestors would then look after you in this life, you hoped. Uh, in some ways it's a kind of negative religion, because if you don't worship them, their souls get into dreadful difficulty in the afterlife, because their souls are kept alive by the offerings that you make to them. If they die, you're going to pay for it. But there was also the positive side, that you believed that your ancestors had a positive interest in your welfare, and in return for your worship, they would do their best to, make, to ensure that your life was good on this earth. It was the religion of the family, and the family was very important to the Chinese, uh, and remains so today. Ancestor worship, Taoism, Buddhism, all kinds of, of nature beliefs, the beliefs that mountains and trees and, and streams and things had gods associated with them, which had to be placated and worshipped. Um, and uh, a huge belief in the presence of evil spirits and ghosts everywhere uh, meant that the Chinese culture was kind of beset with all kinds of religious and quasi-religious phenomena. And Chinese people tended to believe in all of them. The Silk Route not only opened up China to religious and cultural influences of Buddhism, but also to trade with other countries. 
The Silk Route, as its name suggests, was used mainly to trade silk through to Persia and then on to Europe. And this network of roads remained the same throughout later dynasties. Way back in the time of the height of the Roman Empire, had a more or less common boundary with China in Persia. And silk traded across to the Roman Empire you know, around the time of Christ. China, the Romans knew about silk. They couldn't produce it. It came from China. Uh, and some very odd stories of, about how they believed. It was rather like the spaghetti tree. They had this vision of, of the kind of silk tree uh, which produced this stuff which they uh, coveted. Um, but trade with China um, went on not by sea generally, a little trade by sea with the Arab world, but mostly by land across the old Silk Route and into Persia and then down into Europe. But it wasn't really considered to be a good thing by the Chinese. They didn't really want it. They wanted to be self-sufficient. And in later years, we see this same desire being acted out again and again as Chinese rulers have tried to keep China uh, kind of isolated from the rest of the world. And this has gone on right into, well, really into the 1980s uh, with just minor attempts by some slightly more enlightened, perhaps, um, emperors who have tried to trade a bit. Um, and that trade changed over time. There was silk, of course, and later on, um, probably around the 8th or 9th century, we get tea. Um, uh, the Chinese had started drinking tea themselves by that time. And of course, tea is enormously valuable, not just because people like the flavor, um, but it's very good for health because you have to boil the water. And it has an immense effect on, the, on public health if, you, if you're a tea drinking nation. Um, and the Chinese knew about that. Uh, and tea was very important for China. Tea was not widely known of in China until the Tang Dynasty around AD 600, when it was introduced from the border country around India. Its arrival in China is actually ascribed to the later period of the Sung Dynasty of AD 960 and onwards. Buddhist monks had discovered that tea contained something which helped to keep them awake during long periods of meditation. This, of course, was caffeine. Chinese legend has it that the Buddhist monk Bodhidharma cut off his eyelids to help keep himself awake whilst meditating. These fell to the ground where they grew into tea bushes. The leaves on the tea bushes were exactly the same shape as his eyelids. The Chinese have over the years developed a special red clay which they use to shape delicate teapots which is said to improve the flavor of the tea. The worst problem was there was nothing they wanted from, out, from the outside world, so they couldn't trade it. And this, in the 17th, 18th centuries, developed and early 19th century, developed into a, a major problem for traders who wanted desperately to get Chinese goods and had no means of paying for it, except ultimately silver. Uh, and silver um, on the world market became an extremely difficult commodity in the 18th and 19th century because it was all disappearing into China, uh, which the Chinese didn't particularly want either, but there it was. Ultimately, opium was found as, as a payment instead, and that's a very different story and brings us into a much more recent era, um, which one could say ends in 1997 with the handing back of Hong Kong to China, Hong Kong having been founded, one could say, on the basis of the opium trade. China's history, which stretches so far back over thousands of years, still has a resounding influence on the way China looks today. Every part of Chinese life is infused with ancient traditions, and the Chinese pride in their culture has ensured that history and legends are kept alive. One of the most well-known and colorful examples of this is the Beijing Opera, which takes its roots from Chinese drama, a traditional form of entertainment with a continuous history stretching back over 900 years. The first recorded play took place in the early Sung period, around 960 AD, and combined together a number of art forms which had already existed for over a thousand years. Chinese plays are called operas because music is such an important element, yet they bear little resemblance to Western opera. The Beijing Opera was formed in the early 19th century when the Emperor Qianlong ordered opera groups from all over China to Beijing to perform on his 80th birthday. Inevitably, some groups remained in the city and formed a new troupe, and in turn a new form of opera containing music, dance, mime, and acrobatics. The audience will already be familiar with the tales enacted, which are based on historical events and folklore. 
and the characters are two-dimensional in that they are symbols for the virtues and vices which affect us in everyday life. There are four main character types which are identified by traditional makeup and costume. The male role, or sheng, the female role, or tang, the painted face, or xing, and the clown, or shu. The Chinese attitude of balance and harmony is reflected everywhere, even in architecture, with houses arranged around courtyards. The space between the sides of the courtyard is as important as the inside of the building the emphasis being on the contradiction of inside and outside. The orientation of the courtyard construction lies on a north to south axis, with the head of the family living in the superior northern section. Dwellings arranged in such a pattern go back to the earliest days of Chinese history, even in rural areas. But perhaps the finest example is the Imperial Palace, situated in Beijing's Tiananmen Square or the square of heavenly peace. The forbidden city is contained from the rest of the city by walls, and inside there's a vast open courtyard overlooked by the Hall of Supreme Harmony, which contains the dragon throne of the emperor. The inner courtyard is marked by a pair of golden lions at the gate of heavenly purity, and it is inside this inner area that the imperial powers lived. Beijing abounds with traditional examples of Chinese architecture. The general ethic is that buildings should blend in with nature or the surrounding buildings. The Chinese view of the cosmos is that heaven is round and the earth square. Hence man's dwellings are square, whereas sacred buildings where emperors communicated with the heavens, such as the hall of prayer for good harvests, are round. This beautiful example of Chinese wooden building was built without the use of a single nail. Even Chinese gardens are a feat of careful construction, with the ancient Taoist principle of a delicate balance between man and nature constantly mirrored. The hard yang elements of rock is balanced by the soft yin of water, and an energy called qi can flow freely. This energy flow is also essential for a healthy body. Fragments of ancient drawings show that the Chinese have taken slow gymnastic exercise called Tai Chi for over the last thousand years to aid this flow. Chinese cooking continues this theme of balance with flavors and ingredients carefully combined so as not to disrupt the body's harmony. The Chinese practice of herbal medicine has also evolved on Taoist principles with the earliest herbal written in the first century during the Han Dynasty. Most larger towns and cities have apothecaries' shops, which still sell herbs and traditional medicines. So, China's traditions and historical legacy is inextricably bound into Chinese life today. The archaeological discoveries of this century, such as the first emperor's terracotta warriors, and the remaining ancient structures, such as the Great Wall, have contributed greatly to our understanding of China, the Middle Kingdom. They provide insight into moments in China's ancient and diverse history, but doubtless there are still many secrets to be unearthed in the Dragon Land. Elephants, snake charmers with cobras, peacocks and chaotic bazaars, the images most people associate with modern India. The paradox of India is that all these things exist side by side with the satellite dishes, mobile phones, cars and computers. Like the charmed cobra, visitors and travellers over the centuries have surrendered to the fascination of India's extraordinary culture, which is as colourfully diverse as it is mystical and even mysterious. As old as the ancient civilizations of Egypt and Mesopotamia, India is unique amongst these ancient societies in that its culture and beliefs have withstood many upheavals from within as well as invasions from without to remain virtually the only society in the world 
with living religious and social systems so old that they are still vital and intact and showing no signs of dying out even after 5,000 years. paintings from 8,000 BC to 3,000 BC show people with bows and spears hunting deer, peacocks, and even giraffes and ostrich, the earliest excavated settlements in India are of the pre-Harappan period. These were wheat growing and animal farming communities from 3,500 BC the remains of which have been found in Baluchistan, Quetta Valley, and Karlat, all in modern-day Pakistan. Similar settlements have also been found in Afghanistan. The Harappan civilization was so called because of its largest excavated settlement was found at Harappa in Pakistan, where so many other Harappan period sites have been excavated including Mahenjo-Daro. Mahenjo-Daro threw a span in the works because it suggested that here was this great urban entity in India without any, great con without any obvious connections with Europe or with the rest of the habitable world. Much effort was made to discover connections with Mesopotamia to show how one might have sprung out from the other. What, what, is, what, what archaeologists have discovered today is that really Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa are just the tip of the iceberg. Harappan civilization was centered in the valley of the Indus River. Many towns of this period have been excavated along the Indus, and it is also believed that there are many more still to be found. The earliest period that we can talk about are basically on the basis of excavations done at Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. And this, this civilization dates back to about 5,000 years in history. Looking at the uh, planning of the cities, they're extremely modern in concept. They're wide, open roads. There is a perfect drainage system which interconnects throughout the city. The first major urban Indian civilization, Mahenjo-Daro, flourished from 2300 BC until 1500 BC and was discovered accidentally by two British engineers in 1856 who used the ancient archaeological remains of the city as material for the foundation of a railway they were building. roots of the Hindu religion can be seen in the art of this period.
goddess worshipped in this society later evolved into the Hindu goddess Kali. Another important Harappan god later came to be identified as Shiva. A significant legacy of the Indus Valley civilization is the cultivation of Jusipium arboreum, or cotton plant. Weaving and dyeing of cloth also originated here and were among the luxuries that India was to become world-renowned for, as it is even today. Women of the Indus Valley cities probably wore saris very much like those worn now. The fragments of cloth excavated at Mahenjo Daro show a very highly developed skill in spinning and weaving. And it is clear that this is the type of cloth that was so highly valued in ancient Greece and Rome. There was this enormous gap between the rich and the poor, between the nobility and the peasantry. Well, the nobles paraded in Mecca velvets and in embroidered caps. The poor wore nothing but coarse cottons. In fact, clothing itself was very sparse. The fortunes of the Harappans changed dramatically with the arrival of the tribes of Arya from Central Asia, who swept into India around 1500 BC. Some calamity of nature, like a sudden change in their environment, forced the Aryans to leave the steppes of Russia, conquering all of the known world at the time. The Aryans also crossed the forbidding Hindu Kush mountains into India and were to change the subcontinent forever. Soon afterwards, the Indus Valley civilization appears to have collapsed rapidly and vanished. The history of the Aryans in India comes to us in the form of their language, Sanskrit, their poetry, which was memorized and passed on by repetition, and their religion, which is very close to the modern Hinduism practiced today by the majority of Indians. The invading Aryans gradually absorbed the beliefs of the Indian religion, as the important Aryan gods took on the attributes of the local Indian gods. added a new god to their pantheon. This was Indra, a god of war and also of rain. Being a young god, Indra was inclined to get into fights, drink too much and eat everything he could lay his hands on. By this time, a caste system was evolving, which became so engendered in the social fabric of life that people just fell into compartments and they were doing things which their fathers or their grandfathers were doing. So skills passed on from father to son, their professions passed on from father to son. The caste system was so strong that the highest form in this system was the Brahmins. This was followed by the Kshatriyas who were the warrior class which was followed by the Vaishyas, they were the administrative class, and the Shudras, which were the lowest class. There was no intercaste marriages. This was to preserve the people belonging to a particular caste. It was in a kingdom near Nepal, in about 565 BC, that Prince Siddhartha was born. His family belonged to the Kashtraya, warrior caste. Siddhartha grew up to renounce his privileged life of luxury, leave his young wife and small child, and become a wandering hermit in search of spiritual salvation. 
Siddhartha was later named Buddha, meaning the enlightened one, and his beliefs were the basis of a religious philosophy which emphasized compassion for the suffering of others, the practice of meditation, and the principle that desire and sorrow are the cause of all the suffering in the world. Buddhism was unique amongst the Indian religions because in addition to monasteries, there were Buddhist nunneries which allowed women to devote themselves to a religious life. Otherwise, women had no independent status in Indian society in the 6th century BC. By this time, the Brahmins had taken over the religious ceremonies which were being held in every household, which previously were conducted by women. So the women got relegated to the background. They were just, as a housewife, they were conducting their duties. The woman's value is in the maintenance of the house, and a good woman is, is, is like a goddess. You know, she, she'll, she'll take care of, of, all, of all the prosperity in the house. Uh, in other words, it's a very patriarchal logic that you find running all through this time period. Now, that is the evidence that comes through the literature. The same literature also provides us with several episodes, however, where you have examples of women playing extremely important social and political roles. I mean, at precisely the same time period when all these patriarch patriarchal statements were being made, there was a queen that ruled from Delhi. The influence of Buddhism on Indian society is still visible, and some of the finest pieces of Indian art are devoted to Buddha. spread across all of Asia and has many followers today all over the world. About the time that Buddha began his spiritual quest, the kingdom of Gandhara had come under the rule of the Persians, who Alexander of Macedon had desired to conquer completely. With its reputation as a land of endless riches and fantastic creatures, the conquest of India held a lure for Alexander the Great. When he arrived at Taxila, the capital of Gandhara, Alexander was welcomed by the people of the kingdom without resistance in 326 BC. But his advance to Punjab was met with such relentlessly fierce fighting that although victorious, for the first time his famously disciplined army mutinied and refused to fight. Alexander had no option but to take them home. By the time Ashoka came to the throne in 269 BC, the only part of India not under the dominion of the Mauryan Empire was the region ruled by the Kalingas, the current day state of Orissa. In keeping with the tradition of his forefathers, Ashoka set to the task of acquiring the territory of the Kalinga kingdom. The subjugation of this kingdom to Mauryan rule resulted in more than 250,000 people being killed or captured and later dying of starvation and disease. The horror of human suffering on this scale so moved Ashoka that he became a Buddhist and gave up the pursuit of power through the conquest of other kingdoms. Ashoka immediately embarked on a campaign to announce his decision to rule the empire according to the Buddhist principle of Dharma, or righteousness. To make his new beliefs known, Ashoka had his edicts inscribed on huge stone columns, which were then erected all over the country. Ashoka was also revered for presiding over the first great council of Buddhist priests, at which the Buddhist writings were collected into formal scripture. It is due to the initiative of Ashoka that Buddhism became one of the great religions of the world, and even after its influence had declined in India, it flourished in other Asian countries, as it still does today. Ashoka's kingdom was impeccably administered, and by this time, society was neatly divided into rural villages, 
which provided the food, rent, and tax needed to maintain the vast imperial establishment. and cities also had well-structured government bureaucracies which managed every aspect of people's lives. To maintain well-balanced communities, the government would offer incentives of land and livestock to craftspeople to go and settle in particular villages where their skills were needed. We learned that there were uh, efficient craftsmen who could do uh, work in gold, silver, lead, tin. And there are also traces of work done in bone and ivory. Ashoka and his governors realized that while the wealth of the empire came from the multitude of tiny farming communities, every village needed blacksmiths, potters, and tavern keepers. In terms of the dietary habits, wheat and lentils were the staple. And those who could afford it, which means the upper classes, there was meat to be had, although it was expensive. The Mauryan Empire disintegrated bit by bit after Ashoka's death in 232 BC. In 184 BC, the last Mauryan emperor, a descendant of Ashoka, was murdered by his commander-in-chief, ending the first great Indian dynasty, which had lasted for about 140 years. The usurper had no sympathy for the Buddhist ideals of compassion and toleration. He killed Buddhists and destroyed many monasteries before restoring orthodox Hinduism. The next centuries saw many smaller dynasties and empires rise and fall all over the subcontinent. It was a period which has given us a great and varied cultural legacy. The Buddhist sculpture from the Gandharan region combines the delicacy of Greek classicism with the stylized serenity of Indian Buddhist images. By the 6th century AD, many of the Han invaders of the previous century had assimilated into Indian society, and their descendants, the martial Rajputs, held sway over North and Central India. The Rajputs were great patrons of the arts, and it was during their reign that the most magnificent temples were built. at Kaju Raho in Matra Pradesh. This huge complex was built between the 10th and 11th centuries by the Chandela dynasty of central India. The largest and earliest of the Kaju Raho temples is the Lakshmana, built around 950 AD. Its base is decorated with battle scenes while the friezes on the higher levels depict every possible sexual activity. In fact, one of the most famous features of this temple complex, apart from the obvious merits of its engineering and architecture, is the profusion of erotic sculpture, which covers almost every surface. The reason for this emphasis on sex remains a mystery. Although, in the Hindu religion, it is one of the believer's religious duties to get married at the appropriate time and be a good spouse. According to the scriptures, for a man, this is as soon as he has finished his education, at about 20, and the woman was supposed to be one-third of his age. During the marriage ceremony, the groom vows to behave well toward his bride in the three traditional aims of Hindu marriage, piety, wealth, and finally, pleasure. 
It is the religious duty of a good Hindu man to have sex with his wife regularly and to give her pleasure. In addition to war and sex, dance is also featured in the carved images at Kajuraho and other temples. This may be considered an expression of bhakti, a Hindu concept which has been described as the urge to dance and sing one's god. The dancing figures carved on the Kajuraho temples are stylized, just like the forms of Indian dance are stylized. The asparas, or divine female creatures, are idealized feminine beauties. They were said to have foreheads shaped like the waxing moon, eyes like lotus buds, and lips like the bow. The central theme that runs through them all is this uh, element of the, um, the drama on the one hand, and in the solo forms, it's the element of the naika, the woman. Uh, and that woman is not just woman as we know woman. Uh, it's the human soul, it's the jivatma. So it is man-woman. That is a, a person who is vulnerable uh, to all the elements and all the, uh, the ups and downs of life. And, uh, and that, that Jivatma is constantly striving to be united with the Paramatma. That is the perfect being, the perfect soul. This is the theme of all solo interpretation. <laughs> and every state in the country has a particular dance drama form, if that's what you'd like to call it. It was total drama. The actor was not just reciting words and the poetic quality of the, of the drama, but he danced as well, he sang as well, he played an instrument as well. Uh, there was a little step in between, uh, you know, just before he killed his, uh, his opponent, if you like. And that was, that is the coming together of talas and ragas and everything in, in the dance drama. was taking hold. Islam grew out of Judaism and Christianity to become a force that would transform the constantly warring Arab tribes into a unified nation. With this new unity, they would invade and conquer virtually every land in every direction that they turned towards, from Asia Minor to Africa and from Spain to France, across the steppes into Central Asia. This faith when it encountered the ancient Hindu religion with its elaborate caste system, was to create a radical change in every aspect of Indian society, including religion and politics, but most dramatically, Indian culture.
1175, Muhammad of Gur, with his lieutenant Qubd Abdin, attacked Sindh. Muhammad's goal was to build an empire. After taking Sindh, he went on to Punjab, where he set his sights on the Rajput kingdoms that were busy fighting each other. Qubduddin was left by Muhammad to control the new territory of Delhi, and for the next 20 years, he ensured that one state after another fell to the Turks in a period of terrible bloodshed which saw the demise of Buddhism in India as monks were slaughtered and their monasteries destroyed. Then in 1206, Muhammad of Gur was assassinated and Qubdub Din became ruler of the kingdom that came to be known as the Delhi Sultanate. To commemorate his triumph, Qubdub Din began construction of the Qubd Minar in 1199, a tapering stone tower 260 feet high. The Qutub complex with its minars, mosques, late Mughal gardens, commemorative columns, buildings which span almost 800 years in time, is today a World Heritage complex. The Qutub has a central core of random rubble dressed stone, which is locally available in Delhi. So it was probably quarried and brought to this place with the help of elephants, horses or whatever, and then erected in this manner. So there was a central core around which there was an outer core of random rubble, and the staircase passed on between them. And finally, the Qutub Minar is dressed in fine red sandstone, which was brought over 200 miles from Agra, which is not locally available. It shows the importance of architecture of the Minar itself at that period of time. and the mosque attached to it were built on the foundations of an ancient Jain temple, parts of which were used for the new mosque, as had become the custom amongst the Muslim conquerors of India. Today we are standing in the middle of this colonnade, the columns of which at some point would have adorned the 27 Hindu temples which stood in this site before the coming of the slave dynasty. These bells, the Vastupurush motifs, and many other Hindu deities which adorn these temples were defaced with plaster so that they're not shown within the mosque complex as Islam forbade the use of human figures and another, any other living being in its mosques. These lofty arches give you the direction of Mecca, the holy city of the Muslims. And this being the, probably the first mosque in India was later enlarged by Qutbuddin's successor Iltutmish and the illustrious Khalji king Alauddin Khalji. The stones in the mosque were put together using iron dowels, which over years have contracted and expanded. They were pushing out the pieces of the stone. This is quite unlike the stones in the Hindu columns, which have been put together using a little plaster. Uh, we are today standing at the base of the Kuwaitul Islam Mosque, which has been constructed of putting together these highly engraved pieces of Delhi stone, which was engraved by Hindu craftsmen. And you see a lot of these floral, ornamental, carvings next to these Quranic inscriptions which come together in a mosque. So this is one of those cases where a Muslim mosque was built by Hindu craftsmen who had over a thousand years of experience in stone carving.
Here what we have is uh, the presence of a Muslim ar architect or a Muslim master, perhaps telling the Hindu craftsman saying, this is what I would like as a statement of my belief. And the Hindu craftsman saying, well, if you would like this as a statement of your belief, this is the manner uh, my hand can craft it for you. So here you have the Qutub Mosque made by Hindus for the Muslims. In 1820 AD, a new Turkish Mongol dynasty, the Tughlaqs, gained control of the Delhi Sultanate and they moved the capital from Delhi to Tughlabad. This was a heavily fortified city with over 50 gates, some of them with ramps for elephants to enter the city. The unique feature of this new capital was the artificial lakes and reservoirs on which the city depended for its survival. I'm sitting at the edge of a water tank known as Jahannam Ka Rasta. Literally translated, the name means way to hell. Since the city of Tughlaqabad was built away from the river, water supply had to be thought of early on. At least traces of nine tanks can be seen within the fort walls with stored rainwater which was used through the year by the local inhabitants, by the palace people and the army of the Sultan. Sultan Ghyasuddin Tughlaq, who was the commander-in-chief in the Khalji army, was worried about the constant raids of the Mongols from the north and suggested to his Sultan to build a city at this point. The Sultan sarcastically remarked that if you become Sultan, you do it. 
it so happened that he did become Sultan. And the first thing he did was start the construction of this city. The area of the city is almost half a square mile, and the walls cover a perimeter of six and a half kilometers. Some of them reaching a height of 90 feet and a thickness of tw almost 20 to 30 feet. The whole city was completed using complete slave labor and completed in a record period of just four years. The whole fort was divided into three major parts, which included the palace, the citadel, and the city. The palace and the citadel were further protected from the city by, by the use of huge barbicans and gateways. On the south side of the fort, the fort was protected by a large water barrier. And within this barrier stood a hilly outcrop and Gyasuddin realized that if the hilly outcrop was taken over by the enemy, the enemy could attack this fort using things like slingshots, chucking in dead animals to start disease, which would have resulted in the fort having to be abandoned. So he fortified this rocky outcrop, and it was only later that he got this whole idea of building his own tomb within that rocky outcrop much before he died. Although it was more like a forbidding fortress than a cosmopolitan capital, a contemporary historian describes it as being so rich that the great palace was built of gold bricks, which when the sun rose shone so dazzlingly. Looking at the ruins of Tuglabad today, the austerity makes it hard to believe that there could have been anything so fantastic at this desolate place. The Delhi Sultanates eventually collapsed due to infighting amongst various factions vying for dominance without a single strong leader to unify them. In 1526, a new age in Indian history began with the founding of the Mughal Empire by Babur, who, descending from both Tamerlane and Genghis Khan, was a young man in search of a kingdom. In addition to being a brilliant warrior, Babur is famous for his love of poetry and elegant gardens, which he would create wherever he went.
It is due to Babur and his heirs, Humayun, Akbar, and Shah Jahan, that the synthesis of Muslim and Hindu culture took the stunning form that has distinguished Indian civilization from the 16th century to the present. What are the kinds of uh, legacies for the present? You find them all around. I mean, you can look around here and notice some bizarre eclectic architectural styles reflective of a Hindu tradition and our so-called Muslim traditions. But perhaps most of all, uh, I think, would be a language perhaps, a language, uh, our literature, our dress, our food, our forms of discourse, the way we address each other. These are all, you know, by now such a mixture of things of the past and things of the medieval period that you can't even take the strands out anymore. With its extremely diverse religions, people, culture and artifacts, India, India has left a lasting impression all over the world and it has contributed in its own way to the rest of the world. The finest example of cross-culture can be seen in the city of Delhi itself. The city's foundation was laid by the Hindus. Its ornamentation was done by the Muslims. It was bedecked like a new bride by the British. And today it's a mega metropolis, bustling with so many different facets of its character, which have been handed over from times immemorial, which can be seen in some form or the other in its diverse cultures, diverse peoples, and diverse religions. One of the symbols of this country is the Taj Mahal. Built in 1653 by Shah Jahan for his beloved queen. For many, it represents an affinity and appreciation of its peoples, which has been forged over the centuries by invasion and conflicts to create the present modern India. Japan, an ancient culture which spans thousands of years. Japanese legend says that the islands of Japan were formed by the tears of a goddess. As each tear fell into the Pacific, an island formed in its place. In peaceful times, Japan was an elegant land of water gardens, cherry blossom, and poetry. At other times, she was torn apart by the fearsome warriors of the ancient samurai. These men, much feared, were also revered as the most powerful people in Japan. Its history reveals an incredible story.
Although archaeological evidence reveals the existence of a Neolithic culture in Japan, the first period of which there's any in-depth knowledge is the Jomon period. This stretches way back from 10,000 BC up to 300 BC, when the land was peopled by nomadic hunter-gatherers. The Yayoi period, which followed, led to a major transformation in Japanese culture, with the development of new tools and water control systems. This made wet rice cultivation possible, changing the face of the land forever. The hunter-gatherers became settled farmers who formed small communities. In turn, distinct political groups began to form. Japan entered a new phase with the Tumulus period of 300 AD. A clear break with the Yayoi culture happened as political and social institutions developed rapidly. During this age, huge earth and stone tomb mounds appeared along the coast. They were called tumuli, hence the name Tumulus period. These housed the dead rulers of various independent kingdoms. As time went by, one clan based in the Yamato Plain area emerged as more powerful. By the 6th century, the Yamato Sun Line controlled the hierarchy of clans and subsequent emperors descended from this line. Buddhism arrived in Japan from Korea in the 6th century, during the Asuka period. Emperor Yomai and all succeeding emperors were Buddhists. Chinese writing techniques had arrived a hundred years earlier, making Buddhism more accessible to the nobility along with Chinese philosophy. By the end of this period, the Japanese were also starting to adopt the Chinese model for a central government. During the Nara period of 710 to 794 AD, the system of centralized imperial rule, or Ritsuryu system as the Japanese called it, was fully enforced. This set the pattern for subsequent dynasties. The Ritsuyu system continued into the Heian period, but began to crumble in the 9th century. Individual lords built up their own military powers, leading to feuding amongst themselves and the loss of the emperor's imperial power. During this age, there was also a breaking of ties with China, with the Japanese creating their own writing system. Throughout the Kamakura period of 1185 to 1333, an administrative structure run by a shogun, or commander-in-chief, was set up. Individual landowners employed private armies to defend themselves, and the samurai warrior evolved. The shogunate form of government run by the warrior class at a distance from the imperial city was to endure for 676 years. The cult of the samurai continued from this period in Japanese history right through to the 20th century. By the outbreak of the Second World War, the Japanese army still lived by the code of the samurai. This fanatical, devout code, combined with the cult of emperor worship, produced an aggressive fighting spirit which conquered huge swathes of the Pacific in early 1942. In less than a year, Japan had gained control of East Asia and the Western Pacific. This occupation was brutal, and the roots of its discipline lay in the cult of the samurai. Eventually, the tide would turn against them, and with that bitter defeat, the last real links to an ancient tradition were finally swept aside, but it did not die so easily. The samurai uh, are well-known uh, aspect of Japan throughout the world. It's um, uh, mainly through uh, Kurosawa films initially and then things like that, Seven Samurai and Hollywood, uh, other Hollywood remakes after that. The uh, word itself uh, comes from the verb samurao, which actually means to serve. So the samurai were initially the policemen, the military for the, um, the aristocracy in Japan. The samurai role was initially one of policemen, protecting the property of the wealthy landowners. This role gradually altered as they became private armies serving the lords. Eventually, the sheer number of soldiers precipitated a period of fighting known as the Age of the Civil Wars. Warriors came to have an, a major role in society when civil war um, developed. And this was in the uh, 
12th, 13th century, when there were wars between the major clans or coalitions of the clans. And uh, um, obviously the daimyo fighting it out had to uh, place a premium on the, uh, on, on the warriors. The warrior's choice of battlefield weapons would be the katana, which, would be, uh, which is known as a samurai sword, the yari, the spear, and the naginata, which was the uh, halibird. Also um, employed with the uh, samurai on horseback, which would be uh, the ones we use in the uh, kudo, which would be the bow and arrows. All these weapons were uh, related to the samurai and were used in battle. However, should an incident occur where the samurai was disarmed, for example, his, uh, the sword was broken or took off him in some way, they had to resort to an armed combat. An armed combat was a necessity. It was kill or be killed. And um, they had to really rely on their on armed combat skills, which over the years has now developed into um, a very effective self-defense means. In order to service the, the samurai and, and the armies of the daimyo, of course, there were large craft industries. When I say large, I mean that they were little local workshops, but they covered a, a large number of activities. Samurai very often was a soldier on horseback and so um, in preparing him for war you had of course to prepare his horse and, and so um, most of the castle towns did have provision for, uh, for smiths and for preparing things, uh, leather goods for, for the, the horses. So all in all the activity of war and the samurai society uh, did give industrial employment in a society which was broadly agrarian. If you think of sword making, here you have very sharp swords made from what we would call mid medieval times uh, with uh, r remarkably primitive equipment. And uh, even experts in the field today uh, th think of them as, as excellent by world, world standard. <laughs> The samurai sword, the katana, was the soul of the samurai. To, to look at the samurai sword, you would see a slight curb, curvature. Um, they say that the, the kisaki, which is the tip of the sword, would be the face. Um, and the soul of the samurai would be embedded into the, uh, into the sword. The sword was crafted in a very, very special way so that you had a finished product that wasn't brittle and wasn't soft. It was a mixture of the two combined. Researchers say that 
some swords took up to three months to make. The sword was of great spiritual significance to the samurai. They believed that the swordsmiths who crafted these swords had supernatural powers. It was essential that before making the blade, they prayed to the gods to help ward off evil spirits. The iron would then be hammered and folded around 20 times, creating a blade which could cut off an opponent's head with just one stroke. The samurai battle dress is just as complicated as the weaponry. Japanese fighting men of the period carried flags strapped to their backs, which identified them as part of a particular clan. Would often take hours to dress for battle in their armor. Some samurai attempted to create faster methods of preparation, hanging the suits from the ceiling and lowering them down onto their bodies. The armor was made from small overlapping iron plates, which were joined by brightly colored cords to form a decorative and protective skin. On top of this, a breastplate would protect the body, along with iron gauntlets, leg shields and neck collar. A huge variety of increasingly gaudy and fantastic designs were to be seen as rival warlords sought to outdo each other in style and ferocity. Black, shiny lacquer overlaid with gold was a favorite form of decoration. Surely the real ancestor of the Jedi Knights in Star Wars films must have come from here. The armor, uh, known as a yarai, was worn mainly by the top samurai. Um, in fact, the more important they were, the more heavy padding they had. So the hierarchy soldiers, the generals, the commanders, they would have more protection. They would be the first ones that they tried to kill. So if they were shot with arrows, they would use their uh, yarai and all their uh, protection, give them a better chance of surviving an attack with arrows. That's just one example of uh, why the, uh, the, 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 the armor was worn. But obviously, it was to give them as maximum protect protection as possible whilst in the battlefield. The, uh, the kabuto, or the, uh, the samurai helmet, head guard, these would come in uh, various designs. Um, there was no real specific design. Each clan had their own uh, distinguished um, pattern or design. Some would have horns. In fact, um, the more scarier and uh, evil looking they were, the better. This was the same as the uh, frontal face mask, um, which uh, what they wore in Battlefield. The nastier it looked and more evil it looked, um, the better. This was to obviously try and uh, scare the opponents. Battle masks were not only worn by the samurai men, but also by their small, tough horses. Even the harnesses and saddles would be decorated with beautifully intricate designs. The masks for the samurai horses were crafted out of leather. These were designed to complement the terrifying appearance of the warrior, giving the horse an equally bizarre expression. So during the civil wars, um, obviously there emerged uh, quite a lot of um, different clans, the, uh, soldiers 
would group themselves and each clan would ob obviously have to um, have the better on the other clan. And so each clan would um, have their own special training, uh, which, which was unique to that uh, particular um, group. Um, clans were known as Ru, which were uh, schools. So each, uh, each clan had its own Ruha, or particular techniques which they practiced. And these were kept secret. Obviously, if another clan or uh, school uh, would find out what they were using, they, then they could very easily defend themselves from it. So it kept secret, and uh, hopefully they would get the better advantage over their opponents. It was argued that the samurai had a right to rule because of virtue, and that meant that one had self-discipline and was not after profit, was therefore was into service, was loyal, and also that one was studied and learned and became scholarly in a sense of pure in that way, virtuous in that way. So this was one aspect of the cult. The other side of the cult, though, is that one is absolutely fearless, in other words, willing to die for uh, the security of the country, the security of one's lord. These two aspects, one, that you were virtuous, that you weren't interested in profit like the merchants or anybody else. This distinguished you and gave you, therefore, the right to rule. But at the same time, there was a long tradition, of course, of the samurai, essentially a, a lone swordsman, the fellow who's uh, interested in his honor as, as an absolute aspect and was willing to maybe, uh, if his lord was killed or someone affronted him, fearlessly uh, seeking revenge for that, this sort of, uh, not exactly cowboy-like, but in some ways the, the cult of the ronin, the masterless samurai, the one who uh, maintains this fierceness, but with, without seeking, essentially, training, but also seeking a master to, 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 uh, to, to follow, to serve. Japan was frequently shaken not only by the warring lords and samurai, but also by the forces of nature. The Japanese archipelago is directly over one of the most seismically active areas in the world. Nature sent not only earthquakes, but typhoons and severe rains, causing flooding and landslides. This meant constructing buildings which could withstand such forces. The famous use of thin, paper-like walls served a practical purpose so that earthquake victims were not trapped onto piles of masonry. Gradually, it evolved into a more decorative style, using more robust materials. The fact that Japan has the world's oldest and largest wooden buildings suggests that Japan had considerable success in outwitting the elements. Common architectural features can be found throughout the country, despite the great variety of climates. Most constructions basically consist of a box with a large roof, which is sometimes over one half of the total height of the structure. Straight lines dominate Japanese architecture, and curves only tend to appear on roofs and eaves. Chinese architecture and city plans were adopted in the 6th century. Buddhism also arrived in Japan in AD 552, bringing with it a host of architectural and cultural features. Religion in Japan, both in those days and now, is different in concept from from what we're used to in, in Western Europe, um, in the sense that you do not necessarily believe only in one religion, that the concept of religion is much more flexible. And so most uh, Japanese now and in those days w could describe themselves as believing both in Buddhism and in Shinto. Now, um, the focus for uh, uh, Shinto was uh, the emperor in Kyoto, uh, and he performed various uh, rituals to that end. Um, Buddhism was divided into a number of sects. Some of these sects were evangelical 
and were missionary sects, others were much more dormant and, and you might say academic and spiritual. From uh, about uh, the middle of the 16th century, um, Christian missionaries began to come to Japan. They were initially uh, Jesuits. They brought with them a certain amount of technical know-how from Europe of the day, especially the knowledge of gunpowder, which was totally new to the Japanese at that time. One can understand that in the context of the Civil War which was going on, uh, a knowledge of how to make gunpowder gave all the military leaders a considerable advantage. So there was what you might call a, a missionary craze at that time, that uh, the, there was a fascination with the, the missionaries for the message that they brought, but also for the technology which they brought. But it soon became apparent to the Japanese that uh, the missionaries were themselves divided between the Spanish and the Portuguese, and along later came the Dutch and the, and the English, um, uh, the, namely the Catholics on the one side and the Protestants and the fact that they were bitterly divided. And the Japanese began to realize that um, um, this could be a danger because all these four powers were expensive powers and that they might, might at the end of the day have a desire to invade and, uh, and take over Japan. Um, and so from early in the 17th century they began to impose restrictions on the, uh, on the missionaries and their converts uh, and later on um, from the middle of the century, they positively excluded um, missionaries. That meant that from 1650 or thereabouts, um, Japan had really only one contact with the outside world, that, that is the world of Europe, uh, and that was through a small enclave called, called Deshima, an island uh, in, the, in the island of Kyushu. And there they allowed a Dutch colony to continue to trade and to teach Japanese things like medicine. Uh, and most Japanese ports also had vessels going to, going to China. But uh, these, the operations at Deshima and also uh, the operations to China were very strictly controlled. There was a long period of Japanese isolationism which endured from the 1650s to the 1850s. This allowed the separate development of some very typically Japanese cultural institutions which are very distinctive from the West. The formal nature of Japanese society is reflected worldwide in living cultural exports such as martial arts. These still provide a direct and very vibrant link to a ritualized military society of the samurai. Its roots can still be traced in the precise discipline and lethal grace of this most Japanese of traditions. During Japan's feudal era of almost incessant civil wars, there emerged a combative form of self-defense, which, which was designed by the warriors to promote self-protection. The name Jiu-Jitsu, loosely translated, means the art of gaining victory by yielding. Other names, such as the art of flexibility, pliancy, and gentleness, also uh, are relevant to the name Jiu. It is said that jiu-jitsu was forged out of necessity and tempered in the heat of battle. Thus, it became known as a legendary fighting art, a real battlefield martial art, which was used by the samurai warriors.
jiu-jitsu was only a small part of the Japanese soldiers or the warrior class uh, exercises and um, arts which were practiced um, for the battlefield. Ordinary peasants had very little power of freedom in Japanese society. The samurai were at the top of the hierarchy and only a son of a samurai could become a samurai. The samurai could kill an ordinary person for the slightest reason, without the need for any explanation. Administration of the land was still at this stage firmly in the hands of the daimyo, the separate lords. Each daimyo became what he was by right of conquest, using their powerful armies of samurai to improve their position. The shape of Japanese history up to around 1600 had taken a similar pattern. A power vacuum was created by the death of the leader Nobunaga in 1598, who only left an infant son to inherit. The political situation was not resolved until 1600. A famous warrior called Tokugawa Iyasu managed to defeat a coalition of lords from the western area of Japan. This famous battle is known as the Battle of Sekigahara, it made Iyasu the de facto ruler of the country. He was not simply a regent, but a member of the Minamoto, the Shogun family. After consolidating his power, he was faced with the difficult task of creating a viable system of government out of the conflict of a decentralized administration system and his own strong central power. There were various successive um, samurai groups that uh, controlled the, the center of government from that time, from around 1200 and through the uh, 16th century, uh, various periods of stability and instability, civil war, as, as most countries, of course. But then from 1600, the Tokugawa family uh, was victorious in a major battle, uh, probably one of the world's uh, most interesting battles in terms of military history because it was one of the first major battles actually won by the musket. The Battle of Sekigahara enabled Tokugawa Ieyasu to secure primacy o over all contenders. And this began the era of the Tokugawa rule. And um, how he did it was that he created his own family as shogun, which really only means military leader. Uh, now, up till that time, the nominal head of the, of the country had been the emperor in Kyoto. And in order to detach uh, himself fr and his family from Kyoto, he moved the capital away from middle Japan, the Japan of, of Kyoto and Osaka, and, and moved it to Edo, Tokyo. Strangely enough, he did not try and get rid of the emperor. Uh, he accepted him as a, uh, as a spiritual head, and he addressed him always with total respect, uh, if not veneration. Uh, on the other hand, he always kept uh, spies from the, the shogun uh, bureaucracy in Kyoto. Tokugawa was most interested in security because they had actually gained their power by betraying the previous family and taking over. So they were interested in stability. The samurai as bureaucrats. They wanted them to be self-disciplined and, and good and everything, but not to have any lone wolves or, or uh, anyone who was, uh, because uh, someone bumped into them on the street suddenly to pull out his sword and cut him down. So if the country was to be at peace, the important thing was to control all these, all these warriors in order to absorb the energies of the warriors, um, uh, they pla the, the Japanese uh, government, the, the, the leaders of the day, planned an invasion of Korea, the, the idea being to export all these uh, energetic young men uh, who uh, uh, were really out for, for carnage, for killing. Uh, and uh, in, indeed, I mean, uh, uh, an invasion of, of uh, Korea took place in, in the 1590s. Uh, but that was a, a typical instance that the warriors were inclined to get out of hand at that time. 
Tokugawa Ieyasu's control of the Daimyo was so successful that his family supplied a long line of shoguns who ruled Japan for two and a half centuries. With his success, shogun once again became an essential word in Japanese vocabulary. But in order to control the Daimyo, the Tokugawa shogunate were forced to take more and more extreme measures. Shogun controlled the Daimyo by insisting that every other year they should spend in Edo, the capital. That me meant that they were away from their own uh, territories and couldn't stir up trouble, um, uh, uh, creating their own armies and, and attacking uh, the, the Tokugawa. And in periods when they were not in the capital, they insisted that the daimyo should send their wives as hostages to Edo. Uh, and so if they misbehaved when they were back in their home territories, the, the wife would be held to account. Women were traditionally used by the samurai for the service of political marriages, or seriaku kekon, these helped to cement clans in different alliances. The political marriage was such a powerful weapon that Tokugawa Ieyasu banned it on his rise to power. Sometimes the woman's own clan would expect her to spy on her husband's family, putting her life at great risk. It was quite acceptable for her husband to take concubines, but his wife was expected to be completely loyal to her lord. If she was found guilty of adultery, it was her husband's duty to kill her. The concubines fared just as badly, being no better than servants. Foot binding, the deliberate breaking of bones, leading to painful deformation of the feet, was one of the indignities suffered by women right up until the turn of this century. Small feet were believed to be more beautiful, but binding masked a more sinister motive, one of actually constricting women's movements. Japanese gardens reflect all the harmonious aspects of society with a sense of ordered, elegant formality. In times of peace, gardens were considered fashionable places for the samurai to relax, deep in contemplation and writing poetry. The gardens included a balance of water, stones and bridges, and their formal nature still reflects Japanese society today. The unification of Japan meant the role of the samurai had to change. The daimyo were no longer allowed to run large private armies. The feudalistic system, which required practical training to kill in battle, had been replaced. And if the samurai were to survive, they needed to redefine their role in society. During the uh, Meiji rest Restoration, which took place in uh, Japan, the uh, all feudalistic type training was barred. Therefore, all soldiers, samurai, um, had to hand in all weapons, such as the katanas, the swords, spears. Um, they were confiscated. Um, and so what happened was to get away uh, with the, the, the need to carry some type of weapon uh, was still there and in demand. Um, samurai carved wooden swords this is known as the bokto. So um, instead of cutting the opponent, they would bash them uh, simply because uh, you know, using something like a white oak, a very hard wood, 
would still cause considerable damage to an opponent. From 1600 until 1868, there's almost no major war in Japan. So the, the sense of the martial arts developed, many ways we think of them today as, not as sport, but as one keeping in fit and, and a cult of the samurai sword. It was in time of peace that the cult developed because the samurai had to uh, define themselves and raison, raison d'etre because in the society which had, been, had placed them at the top, uh, they had to, uh, I guess, have a, a theory legitimizing that position. During this period, called the Edo period, the samurai became an urban class, moving from the country into the castle towns and cities. Although they only represented 7% of Japan's population, within the towns they made up at least 70% of the community. The side effect of the samurai being forced to neglect their martial arts was that the old craftsmen, such as swordsmiths, saw a severe decline in their trade. The economy of the castle towns flourished, however, as the samurai adapted into their new environment. Over that period of two and a half centuries, the, uh, the, the, the class structure changed, or, or at any rate, the power which each of these groups had uh, changed. At the start, it was still a feudal situation in, in a situation of, of warfare or potential warfare. But then after two centuries of peace, the samurai no longer had a job to do. At this point, uh, I think one has to say that the, that the samurai diverged. There were those who rose to the top and adapted themselves to a new role. And that role could be as administrators or as school teachers. On the other hand, many of them uh, really were unable to adjust to, to their new role, tended to become drunkard. And, and so one of the images you get of samurai in the 18th century is of uh, layabouts who just uh, you know, go around in these castle towns and uh, uh, are frequently to be found in the brothels. Uh, you know, a great decline from the high days of Bushido and, and the, the cult of the warrior. As the castle towns developed and as the, uh, Tokyo became uh, something of a metropolis, then there developed a, a, a cultural life of, uh, w which had not existed previously. So you had theatres and you had a playwright like Chikamatsu who was the Shakespeare of Japan. You had uh, a, a group of poets who are even now regarded as quite distinguished. Uh, you have uh, the authors of the ukiyo-e floating life, uh, wood, woodblock prints representing life in those days. You have um, a development of, of, of Japanese music. So Japan was no longer feudal at the, at, the, at the end of the 18th century. It's becoming increasingly urbanized and uh, People nowadays in Japan are still looking back on that period as a, as a creative period. The cult then of these, of the, the loyalty and the uh, strength of spirit of these uh, men and the willingness to die for, for honor became uh, the popular, the most crucial uh, myth in Japanese drama. So the, uh, the myth of the loyal samurai has crossed over into the modern period and is still something that uh, is has a, has a force, uh, even when many of the other sort of traditional things have, have languished in the past. Emperor Hirohito ascended the throne in 1926, and within a decade, Japan was on the verge of being involved in world war. Japan's isolationism had ensured that she was not subjected to the horrors of the First World War, and so the decision to show her strength was made. In 1931, the Japanese military powers occupied Manchuria, and then set up the state of Manchukuo, 
The military were tired of what they considered to be ineffective, feeble civilian politicians and were determined to push ahead with Japan's Asian expansion. Throughout the 1930s, military extremism grew, bolstered by the traditional ethics of the samurai. In December of 1941, Japan launched attacks on Pearl Harbor and European colonial holdings throughout Asia. In less than a year, Japan gained control of East Asia and the Western Pacific. The occupation was swift, brutal, and savage. Atrocities always occur in war, but the Japanese army was notorious in its treatment of prisoners of war. It's believed that up to 20 million people died in the Pacific. Samurai traditions of vengeance, combined with their belief that the most honorable way to die was fighting, made the Japanese military an awesome opponent. One of the main reasons why the samurai were probably some of the greatest uh, warriors of all time, one has to look at the, the belief that they had. Um, they were ready to die in battle. In fact, one of the greatest um, honors was to be killed in battle. So you have a, a soldier who can go into a battlefield with that belief, he's going to be very, very hard to beat. The, the, the warrior code was as such that uh, enabled them to carry all these uh, necessities things like um, preparing for battle, as well as actual battle itself. Internally, they were prepared, um, as well as, obviously, the, the technical side. And I think the combination of these two together, the skill and the, uh, the inner belief, made them very, very strong warriors. In the modern period, of course, when Japan is, uh, feels threatened by the black ships of Perry, or Commodore Perry from America and the forced opening of the country, many of the, the samurai, the young samurai, were the ones who led the government, uh, the restoration and the uh, reforms and things that came in. And the, the cult of the, 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 within the military, both the Navy and the Army, were in many ways, especially in the pre-war period, based on these traditional uh, ideas of the, of the warrior as someone absolutely serving the nation. And with the cult, the rising cult in the late 19th century, focused back again on the emperor and absolute loyalty to the emperor. By 1943, there were signs that Japan's situation was reversible, with its army losing fierce battles in the Pacific. Germany surrendered in 1945, but Japanese leaders stubbornly refused to follow suit. That August, the ultimate weapon of death, the atomic bomb, was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Second World War ended one week later. The unconditional surrender of Japan was broadcast by Emperor Hirohito. It was the first time his country heard his voice. Japan lost its emperor's claim to divinity, its empire, and its army. Post-war Japan is now quite different in structure, but the recent history of this century has yet to be properly addressed by the Japanese. The end of the war saw the final demise of the samurai, although the traditional martial arts are still studied throughout the world. There's also a great legacy of Japanese art and architecture, highly coveted by art connoisseurs. Japan underwent dramatic reconstruction politically and economically, and now has one of the most flourishing economies in the world. The horrific events of this century have forced Japan to shed the ancient feudal ways and look towards a very different future.